Good afternoon, or morning, I should say, everyone. Um, I've got a, a bunch of emails requesting that I do some more tutorials, so I kind of decided to just try to do one every week. And that way we can kind of, because uh, I kind of, I myself always learn better by watching other people work or seeing how they do certain things. Sometimes the the book tutorials or the PDF tutorials that you you find are just they miss they're just missing stuff and so I kind of hope that this will help some people out. This week the homework our assignment is to restore these old photographs and that's the one I chose to do. There down here I have mini bridge open and you can see I've got some other stuff loaded in there um, I was gonna do this one that image there and I started working on it but this image is a mess and you can see that up close it's got many many separations everywhere and it's hard to find a clean work area and the spot healing brush isn't really going to help you on on this one this one and because of the type of coat that he's wearing it's not going to go real easy and it's going to be reduced to what I kind of like to call working at the on the pixel level so that's where you'll literally zoom in and where you can see the individual pixels and then start to blend areas So you can get some of these marks out. It would be a long, long process. Um, sometimes you are led to believe that Photoshop has these magic tools that will just handle all this stuff for you, like the spot healing brush. Um, if I select the spot healing brush and I come over here and say, oh, I'm just going to wipe out this little mark right here you can see that it kind of does but not really and if I was to come up here and it might work on this great white spot so what I'll do is maybe adjust my size a little bit and try to split that line because all this thing is going to do is sample from all around the area inside the circle and then create an average and re and do that average so for something like this this great white area then it's it works pretty good but as soon as you get down here to say all these cracks in this marble it's not going to work so good and you might think oh well it looks to be working okay well, there's so much in this area that once you get going on it, it'll start to actually create patterns that, that are really easy to pick up. It's like the clone, clone stamp tool. If you get going with the clone stamp tool, that thing will start making patterns too. And then those are just real easy to detect. So say for example, up here I might want to use the clone stamp tool to maybe try to fix this area here so I'll press alt and then left click drag over to where I want to sample and it'll kind of give me an idea of what it's trying to to do and because of these marble patterns are so scattered I would use a, a fairly large sample area and then maybe try to sample from a few different areas like way down here to just try to reproduce some of that randomness um, another thing let's go back to the original thing that I'm working on this image here there's 
first of all, before you get started doing something like this, you kind of have to have a plan. The first thing I did, I'm going to open this. You kind of have to have a, a plan in the beginning of how you're going to attack this because this is going to be a long, a long process. This week's homework is tough, especially for people that haven't used Photoshop before. Um, one thing I noticed that the tutorial says, oh, open it in camera raw and do you know spot healing and clone stamping and marquee selection tool and yeah those tools are going to work great for little areas like these little splotches in here or maybe her you know pieces of her dress but for the most part this is going to be a whole bunch of mixture of the paintbrush color sampling you're going to take maybe um, your eyedropper tool and reduce the sampling area down to three or five pixels or whatever it is say this eyedropper tool and do a five or three by three average and then you'll just get in here and sample areas say right there took a nice average grab your paintbrush and start painting and that's pretty good but it's not a fast process there is no tool in here that's gonna make just two or three clicks and you're finished and there is no super fast way to do most of it this is some of this is gonna be pretty tough I uh, I actually had to make a this is what I did and this is this is the, the probably the toughest part in the original image I don't know if anyone can see it down here the original image here you can see that half her face is missing and that's a tough repair because the only way to do that is either with your paintbrush and you have to be a bit of an artist as in a real artist not someone who's just artistically inclined and literally get in there and repaint the image now what I did was I selected I used my rectangular marquee tool I selected this part of her face much as as much as I could and then I brought it back over on this side and I put it in there the problem with this is you'll notice in now she looks a little bit weird like this process here um, this is the this is the piece I actually used right here and it's and I getting it in there and getting it lined up so that she doesn't look like an alien is pretty tough um, so that's how damaged her face was before and then I was able to use this tool to kind of get in there and make her look a little bit better I don't know if I'm sold on the pro on this technique for doing this it, it's faster I'll give you, it is faster but it's just to me this doesn't look quite right another tool would be um, I don't know the spot healing brush kind of do that one again I guess You'll, you'll see the spot healing brush is good for areas 
like this back here. As long as you can take a sample, a clean sample on both sides of what you're working on, like that area, the spot healing brush is great. But if you think you can come up here and use it on a tree branch, it's just going to delete the tree branch. Um, unless you want to go maybe reduce your brush size so small that it's the same width as the tree branch and then maybe get in there and do that but still it doesn't look right you're you're better off going in with your eyedropper tool taking a clean sample as close as you can to the repair area grabbing your paintbrush and just painting that in and then to make it look even cleaner come back with the smudge tool and just blend the area in periodically you'll go over to your navigation kick you back out to 100% and take a look at it. Um, there's in, in part of your planning on how you're going to attack this, like for example this one, I knew I wasn't going to want to deal with because of the time, I'm just not going to completely restore this picture for a grade. It just the time involved is too much. So I cropped a lot of this heavily damaged part out that's the very first thing I did is I decided how far I wanted to take this and how much time I wanted to put into it. And then I, I start by eliminating as much as the hard work as I can. And that, to me, that torn edge was bad. So I didn't want to deal with it, so I cropped it out. If your customer says, no, you can't crop anything, then you gotta, you got to leave it in. Um, another thing I want to touch on is if you don't have a decent way to paint, say, like I've used all kinds of tools, tried everything from optical mouses to scroll mouses to every kind of trick for the mouse to do this as far as being able to move this cursor as fluidly as possible. The best one I, for me, is a marble mouse. And I think you'll notice that a lot of graphic designers use a similar setup of, of a marble mouse or a, a ball mouse that you just move the ball with your fingertips. And the other is a graphics tablet. I have a Wacom pen tablet, and it, it's the big one. I can't, it's the, what is the PTK 640, it's a big tablet, but what I can do with this tablet blows away what I can do with my mouse, and your hand will feel so much better, and your results will be so much better as well, plus I can set the tablet up to control um, parts of this the back tool or brush sizes or whatever I can just I'm s it's so much more productive than with a traditional mouse and even if you're used to the mouse and whatever you you can't compete m with someone using a graphics tablet you just can't so if you're serious about becoming a graphic whatever you need to get a graphic tablet and learn how to use it there's just no better way to do this until they come up with mind control stuff that you can use to control the mouse forget it this is the best way to do it uh, paid about 400 for mine they have smaller ones that are about the size of a postcard but you really you I, I like having as much surface area as possible so I'm just going to kind of work on this for a little bit, and you can watch how I do it. I'm using the graphics pen, the graphics tablet, and I'm just, right now it's it's all, I'm just trying to use what little I know about art to make this look better. 
so that I can blend these areas in better make make the picture look more original I guess you kind of find that with these Adobe tools you know the clone stamp and the content aware stuff if you s start using these tools too much let's say for the clone stamp or whatever and just move along real fast your image even though you're repairing it it will start looking fake you the patterns that those tools leave behind and the way that they do things um, after a while it builds up and you'll start to notice that it doesn't look as good as you thought it would so I like this smudge tool for blending areas in and you can see right there that that color that I picked didn't really jive with what was next door to it so now I gotta go back use my brush try to blend that in a little bit better I want a little bit of a shadow there okay that looks better maybe bring the smudge tool in here and now one thing I don't want to do in this picture is start using this is a black and white picture done a long time ago before long before the age of digital photography so I'm not going to start putting a bunch of weird filters on here and, and things to sharpen the image up that would make the image look too good like there's no way that uh, you know an old camera from 1920 can take a, uh, an HD picture so I'm not going to start putting sharp filters on here and funny masks to give it depth that would just it would look strange it might look cool but it would look strange I want this image to be as original as possible and it's not going to be a whole lot of sampling colors and painting and that's pretty much it it's just going to be a whole bunch of that now down here you can see that it's already gotten a bunch better her face is a little better to me she's looks like an alien of course, maybe she really looks like an alien. I don't know. But that, when you copy and paste one side of a face and flip it over there, just it, this nobody's face is exactly the same on both sides. And it just, to me, it just looks alien. When you're sampling color areas too, I'll get in close after I fix this. When you're sampling color areas, especially around a damaged area, you'll notice that these damaged areas, there is some black and, and other unnatural colors, and probably close to the damaged area, the, the color isn't accurate at all. And this is where you're going to have to use whatever training or skill you've got to decide that where you're going to sample from you because you want a, a good color so if I sample from in here I don't think that I can pick that shadow up pretty good so I, I think I'd sample from way back in here and maybe take two samples on either side and see and I think that that looks pretty good but see it's coming gray a little bit which is okay I guess because it's a shadow but I think we I can just pepper the area with a little bit of cup of color and then come back with my smudge tool and just kind of blend so that it might be a new color that I've put in there but I'm blending it in with the original stuff that's there and it might be okay. The smudge tool is your friend. Now, bring that back out to about 100%. And look at it. 
It looks okay, but she's, you can see in there she's kind of getting freaky leg syndrome. Uh, that leg looks way out of proportion to her other leg. And that's just part of the limits of the photography of the time because the shadow just gets lost. But there, this is one of those things where you would have to decide, should I correct a mistake of the era of photography and come in here and remove this shadow a little bit and let her leg kind of jump out a little bit more. Especially down here. I don't know up to you I'm probably not going to do it but I might now another thing too is your brushes are going to become pretty important right now your brushes are probably just a mess to you but later on you're probably going to really love the round brushes with size are the a lot of brushes that I use a lot um, 13 and then up here I've got my opacity and flow if I turn the flow down to say 50 percent when I paint the paint comes out really slow half the rate it would at 100 percent and I can paint slowly if I'm not comfortable doing something quickly or if I just trying to now it's at about 3%. It will take a long time for any color to even show up here. But it's it's a good... When you, when you first start out, you're not going to be real confident about painting something like this. So that lets you kind of go slow. It takes a little bit longer, but you can go slower, and it's more forgiving. Another one is the square brushes I like to use. But I'm not going to do this. So right now, our image is pretty good. And I don't know if I'm going to finish it all the way. Just kind of demonstrate that I know how to use all these tools and move forward because this these Im these images are bad let me try some spot healing in here on her dress this was a, a pretty good I have to get a bigger brush though I don't know how good this camera is going to be, but you can see that with the spot healing brush, I can move pretty fast. But there's some things that it's not doing. For example, this shadow right here that comes across through here, it didn't, it didn't translate that at all. So I'm going to get my little three pixel brush out. And I'm going to sample that shadow. And then I'm going to come in here and try to reproduce that shadow before I get too far gone. That brush is a mess. This one I'm probably going to have to go down to a one. that shadow and this one a little bit kind of make up for where the spot healing brush didn't translate a few of these things too well see how my cursor is right now a little crosshair 
if you ever open Photoshop and your all your cursors look like this and you can't figure out why, your caps lock is on. Let's take a look at it. That looks a little better. So that's kind of the basics of photo restoration 101. It's not easy and it's time consuming and that's why the people that can do it well make the big bucks. Um, these pictures decay, are decaying every day. And the only way to digitize them is this. Scan them in using a, as big a DPI as you can and get them into Photoshop and get them restored just like this. You have to be half computer scientists and half artists to do well in this. Another thing I didn't touch on was the color balance, the hue and saturation. I, um, I opened the layer, made a copy, it opened it, made a copy of the layer, and then I pulled all the saturation back out because the original was so yellow. side by side. That's the original down here and that's mine. I put an adjustment layer in there, grab the hue and saturation, and I pulled the saturation way out of it. And if I add it back in, it goes right, right back to being yellow. I pulled that saturation down and I think some people do that before, some people do it about halfway through all their corrections, some people do it last. I like the beginning because it makes the picture easier to look at. So there you go. Sorry for running long. Next week, look forward to another one.